Good evening, I'm Ira Flato. You guys caught on to that too. I tried it with Carl Castle, it didn't work either. I'm Anthony Hunt, WVPE station manager. This is so cool, huh? I, you know what, in fact, in fact, here, everybody smile. Let's, what do we got? Okay, great. We'll put this on the Facebook page. You know, we're not normally a visual medium, so it's kind of hard to... That'll be good. All right. You know, uh, we work really well together as a good partner, and I wanted to say thanks to all of you who helped uh, us have a really successful pledge drive uh, that we just finished, and uh, we're really excited to be working in particular here with uh, a fabulous organization that's helping bring these folks here. So let's bring out the Dean of the College of Science, Mr. Greg Crawford. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. We have a full house, and we're very excited about tonight's event. Uh, the College of Science is celebrating a 150-year anniversary this year, and so this was a perfect event to actually kick off this celebration that's been going on all week. It is our pleasure to welcome Science Friday here to the University of Notre Dame and Ira Flato. As you guys know, uh, it's, uh, it's a, wonderful, a wonderful group that presents science to everybody around the world, uh, lay people and scientists, and everyone's listening about how science and engineering are solving big problems of our time. And so we're very honored to have them here and to bro uh, live broadcast this tonight and, and show and interview a few of the Notre Dame scientists and some other folks that are here in town. So we're very, very excited. As you know, Ira is a sort of a world-renowned radio show celebrity. He is a recipient of many, many awards, the most recent one, the Isaac Asimov Award. And in addition, many of you have probably seen Ira on uh, the, the hit sitcom series of Big Bang Theory. And uh, he's not just a great radio caster, but he's also wonderful and very funny. We are so happy to have them here, and the crew has worked all day. And I just wanted to just give, if you guys give a big round of applause for Science Friday. There was eight of them here, and they were... Those guys were working nonstop, uh, very late at night and early in the morning, so they made this all happen. And so it's my pleasure, as you know, Ira talks about science as being cool and sexy, so it's my pleasure to introduce tonight the very cool and sexy Ira Flato. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. I don't know about being cool and sexy, but I have a face for radio, as they say. So I'm very happy to be here. Thanks. Another round of applause for Dean Crawford. Let's. They, you guys have been so welcoming. We're so happy to be here. WVP, the university, have made us feel very much at home. We got a full tour of the campus. We got into the locker rooms back there in the football team. Uh, we got to play on the AstroTurf a little, but it's not AstroTurf really, the new modern stuff. We got a great tour. We have, uh, we've been very happy to be here. You know, we only choose to go to about four places all year long on our, on our road trips, and we're very happy to select and have, to be, have been selected by WVP and the university to come here. And we're going to have a great show tonight, a lot of fun things that are happening. We have the Glee Club here. We're going to... I, I, we never had a glee club singing live on Science Friday. We've had all kinds of, you know, acts, but never a real glee club. They're going to sing a few songs for us tonight. To, uh, to start us off, we're going to have Dan Stowe and the Notre Dame Glee Club will be pitching in with music throughout the snow, and they're going to kick us off with Tom Lehrer's The Elements. Dan, take it away. antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and ion, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, letizium, vanadium, and lanthium, and osmium, and astatine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, 
and iodine and thorium and thulium and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and born gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Strontium, and silicon, silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and magnesium and mercury and molybdenum and magnesium and dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium, lead, praseodymium and platinum, plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium. And cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. And calcium, calcium, chromium, curium. There's sulfur, californium and fermium, berkelium and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium and argon, kryptonium, radon, zinc, and zinc, and rhodium and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. And argon, kryptonium, radon, zinc, and zinc, and rhodium and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. There may be many others, but they simply have no name. And let's hope that we'll discover more here at Notre Dame. Ba-ba-la-da, This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. We're here at the Notre Dame de Bartolo Performing Arts Center in South Bend, Indiana. And you know, we, we talk a lot about bacteria on Science Friday, if you listen to our show. They're everywhere. It, they're, there's no escaping, escaping them. They're, they're fermenting your beer. They are producing antibiotics. They're controlling your gut. These bacteria in our gut, we call the microbiome, are big news these days, especially if you listen to Science Friday. We talk about it all the time. There's anxiety, obesity, cancer. The microbiome has a role in all of these diseases. But bacteria are also very active in the soil. And understanding them is part of uh, a new frontier of plant biology in soil and plant biology. My next guest is researching the plant microbiome, Gene Severson is a professor of biology at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. You know, as, as I said before, we, we hear a lot about the human biome, but uh, we don't know much about, the, hear much about the plant microbiome. Why is that? Well, I think part of it is because we take plants for granted. They're just, they're green things, they sit there. You hear people say, dumb as a potted plant. And yet, we're finding out that just like we have bacteria all over our skin, some of, whom, some of which are beneficial, plants have bacteria on their leaves, on their stems, in their roots. And plant biologists have known for a long time there are some bacteria that help plants fix nitrogen, but that's about as far as it's gotten until we came along, <laughs> me and my colleagues. And so what did you discover? What, what, what did you and your colleagues discover? Well, what we did was there was a terrible outbreak of foodborne illness in Europe, and it turned out to be a really nasty form of E. coli. That food poisoning? Yeah, yeah. food poisoning. People died. 53 yeah. people died. At least 53 people died. And it turned out it was a new strain of E. coli, came in through probably contaminated water, and it was finogeek sprouts. And my colleague Sean Lee and I thought, oh, people have been eating bean sprouts for thousands of years without dying. Why is that? Let's get some beans. Let's get some bean sprouts. Sprout them. Let's put some bacteria on them and see how many colony forming units per milliliter of water you need to grow E. coli on the bacteria. That was our plan. Uh -huh. But it didn't work, like, work out like that. Serendipity somewhere stepped in. There was, because as good scientists, Sean is a microbiologist, uh, me as a plant biologist, and Josh Shroud is an engineer, we all knew you have to have a control, right? So we're gonna take our seeds, we're gonna put them in bleach for 10 minutes, we're going to rinse them in alcohol, sterile water, make sure we've gotten rid of everything on the seed, all the surface contamination. And then we were going to, we were going to just grind up the powder as a control, right. just to test to see, did we do a good job of this sterilization, right? And then we had all these other experiments planned, but we never did them because Big bacteria grew out of the control. Wait, but didn't you clean off all the... Yes. But you, you put them in bleach, I would think that would kill we everything. We cleaned off everything. So where we did the bacteria come from? We did this experiment over and over and over again. They came from inside the seed. 
In the seed. In the seed. Inside the seed. Yes. Is it so hard to believe we have a microbiome inside us? But people don't think of plants as having anything going on on the inside of the plant, only that they provide the food for all the rest of life forms on Earth. But they have inside the seed, it took us almost two years to prove to ourselves that this was really true. And it's really true. We isolated a bacteria. We knew this was going to be something special because this bacteria, how you do this is you put the powder in a nutrient broth and then you plate it out on a plate. My colleague Sean Lee does this. And then you pick the colonies and you put them in media. You're trying to characterize them by right. their phenotype. And there was one that swarmed all over the plate. Wow. It had a behavior we've never seen before. Thought, that one, let's sequence that one. So we sequenced the whole genome and it turned out that this was a species of bacillus that associates with plant roots, but it wasn't known to colonize wow. the insect. So what is, it, what is it doing beneficially inside? This is, what, this is what we think it's doing. This is what our data suggests. If you take this bacteria, we call it C3, unimaginatively for the third colony. Yeah, scientists are like that. They just put yeah. little letters. In. And if you take C3 and you put it on a plate of E. coli, you get this zone of clearing like a donut. That means it's killing the E. coli. And if you put that C3 on a plate with two plant pathogens that are related in the same general big family as E. coli, it kills those plant pathogens. Big zone of clearing like this. If you put that bacteria on a plate with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, a human pathogen. Something I do every day. Yes. yes. Right. right. That bacteria, it just swarms all over it. Like so it's protecting plant. the seed from attack by these bacteria, maybe in the soil? Yes. So the seed can germinate and not, and not uh, rot or something while it's in the soil? Yes. When that, when that seed is, germ when it takes up water, it hasn't photosynthesized yet. It's helpless. It's, it's totally helpless. It can't make its defensive chemicals. It's got to get up above the soil so it can photosynthesize, right? right? For three or four days, it's totally vulnerable. How can this possibly work? Everything in that soil wants to eat it. There's a whole host of bacteria and fungi that would like nothing better than to gobble that seed up. It's free lunch. Well, so how does it work? I get it. I know what free lunch is or not about. <laughs> um, but ha so does this, how does the bacteria get in the seed originally so that you find it there? So what we did to show that it's a plant microbiome uh, plant microbiome interactions are difficult because if you grow the plant in dirt there's thousands of other things in dirt it's hard to pin anything down so what we did was surface sterilize our seeds put them on filter paper and put a little shot of the C3 bacteria in the water hmm. that the plants took up and our hypothesis was the plants when they take up water from the soil, they take these bacteria up, and they take these bacteria up selectively. They signal, they can sense which bacteria are the good guys and which bacteria are the bad guys. And we found when we did that, the, the seeds do take this bacteria up, that the bacteria do go all throughout the plant body. And then the best thing was that this bacteria gets packaged into some of the seeds, not all the seeds, but some of the seeds. It's vertically transmitted. Wow. That's what we call that. Wow. So that means that the plant, it's an insurance policy. It means that even if this particular soil may not have very many of these protective bacteria, there's going to be some seeds that come packaged with them. And hmm. bacilli are perfect for this because the seed dries down. It gets really, really dry, about as dry as the Atacama desert. Wow, that is dry. That's dry. Almost, almost as dry as California is now. Uh, almost. But bacilli, bacilli, they don't care about that. They just yeah. sporulate. And right. in that spore, they can put up with dry, they can put up with radiation, like a little space capsule. They are. They are. You know, I was a judge on the Google Science Fair this year, and yes. there were three teenage women whose project this year looked something exactly like this. They were dusting cereal grain seeds with bacteria that they found in the soil, and they, the crops sprouted weeks early, and uh, the yields were increased by up to 75%. So this goes right along with what you're saying about bacteria in the soil. Yes, and these were, that 
those, those three young ladies were very insightful because they were using uh, cereal grains, oats, uh, wheat, and barley. Right. Okay. And they were using rhizobium, which we understand as a bacteria that associates with beans, not cereals. Yeah. So why would you expect rhizobium to assist the germination of cereal grains? But it did, and not only that, they, they, have, they developed a hypothesis about why it does, and this has support in the scientific literature. It does, has nothing to do with nitrogen fixation. It has to do with something the bacteria makes. Should I tell you what it is? Well, Sounds in, fancy. In, in terms that we can all understand, that would... <laughs> Well, you understand lipo, chido, oligo, saccharides? There you have it, folks. Uh, that, that's what it was. Uh, but, but they were saying that they thought it preserves the seed from rotting, just like you were discovering yes. the built-in seed bacteria were doing. It and, stimulates that particular mm, molecule, mm. stimulates plant growth hormones. Right. So are, are, does the soil fill, well, we love to talk about microbiomes and the soil microbiome. So the soil is basically, so to speak, fertile ground, sorry, yes. for, for studying all these bacteria that we have no idea what they do yes. in the soil. The, the soil, I mean, a good farmer, a good organic gardener will say the soil is alive, and it is. There are millions of organisms in, in a little uh, mm -hmm. in a couple cubic centimeters of soil. And some of these get into us and are beneficial, some not so much. Some are invited into the plant. The plant just doesn't take anybody who comes to the door. Right. The plant can tell the good guys from the bad guys. So this is what's so exciting. We can, perhaps if you took a suspension of these C3s and you sprayed them on your sprouts, perhaps the sprouts that take up the bacteria, the nasty E. coli, maybe they, they don't have their protectors with them. And that's how the E. coli can get going. We, we, can, we can test all that. We haven't done it yet. This is a hypothesis, but we're very excited about yeah, it. Because isn't it true that there's so many bacteria in the soil and they won't grow in the laboratory? That like 90% of the bacteria yes. in your soil, we don't know what they're doing because we've never been able to grow them in the laboratory. That's right. Because of metagenomics, because we can take a scoop of soil now and and extract DNA out of it and infer from certain sequences in there the bacteria that are right. in there. It's opened up a whole new world. There are organisms in this soil just because we can't put them on a plate doesn't mean they're there. Right. Now, are we disrupting the soil if we plow it through? Are we disrupting these communities of microbiomes? It's possible that the way we've done our conventional agriculture, I have to say it's possible because it's a hypothesis. I haven't shown it that the way we do our conventional agriculture with plowing and compaction and salinization from irrigation, that the, one of the reasons you get the yield loss and the problems is that your, the soil microbiome becomes depauperate. It, the, the, good, the good guys usually are the first to leave. It's like when your neighborhood goes downhill. The good guys are the first to leave. Right. The bad guys are the last. And we may be quite inadvertently doing this to our soil. Now, this requires controlled scientific studies, but it's, yeah. but it's worth looking at. Well, Jeannie, thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. This was, this was, this was fascinating. And Jean Romero Severson is a professor of biology at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. When we come back, a look at the Kellogg brothers, you know, of, of, of Corn Flakes fame. They were early pioneers of, listen to this, of whole grain, vegetarian eating, and the exercise tape. Stay with us. This is Science Friday from PRI. On the levee, listen to the nightingale. Way up above, 
above, laughter on the levee, no one's heart is heavy. All God's children got someone to love. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. See if you recognize this slogan. Eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. Who said that? Do you remember? Yeah, you do that. Huh? That's Michael Pollan's mantra, if you recognize that. But it's also really come into vogue for believers in veggies, whole grains, and probiotics. But guess what? Way back in the 1880s, just up the road a piece here in Battle Creek, Michigan, the surgeon and missionary John Harvey Kellogg he was preaching the same principles to his patients at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Kellogg claimed that God had chosen him to make the world a healthier place. He considered meat a death sentence and kept a vegetarian wolf to show off at lectures. We'll talk about that a little more. He, he warned of the dangers of tobacco smoking and he invented health foods like nut-based protein patties, soy milk, peanut butter, and of course, cornflakes, which his brother W.K. Kellogg brought to your breakfast table each morning, as they say on the commercial. Science historian Howard Markell is here to give us the story of these two visionary brothers and their innovations in wellness long before science caught up with them. Howard Markell is the author of An Anatomy of Addiction and a forthcoming book on the Kellogg brothers. He's also professor and director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Welcome back to Science Friday. It's How great you? to be here, Ivan. Thank you. Thank you. Looking back at uh, John Harvey Kellogg's ideas, was, was this guy, was he ahead of his time or what? He was really ahead of his time, and he was often right, even for the wrong reasons, but he was a remarkable visionary. What do you mean for the wrong reasons? Well, you know, you mentioned John Harvey was a missionary. He was uh, a Seventh-day Adventist. They were the group that founded Battle Creek, or were original settlers there. And he had all sorts of religious connections to his medical thoughts. Mm -hmm. But then as the science developed, he was very astute at reading the latest scientific discoveries, and he would match those scientific discoveries to his ideas about vegetarianism, mm -hmm. avoiding tobacco and alcohol, and uh, living a good, full life. Let, let's talk about some of these dietary innovations. If I were at the sanitarium, I could be there any time now. Um, I'll take you, it's right up the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, give me a typical meal. What would a meal at the sanitarium be like? Well, originally they even served meat, but John Ooh. Harvey quickly stopped that. But it was all vegetarian and grain-based. Uh, there was, uh, and, and John Harvey was very interested in making things pal pal uh, palatable because, you know, mush is, is mush. And uh, so he would create things, and first he wanted a grain bread based on graham crackers and graham wheat, and he made this hard biscuit uh, that a woman actually broke her tooth on and threatened to sue him. Wow, not good for publicity. No, so that's where he came up with flaked cereal foods, because oh, they so didn't he break flaked, your teeth. He yeah. took the same brand bread and, bre and flaked it? Right, right. And for, created the cereal? Well, first, well, there was a lot of steps in between. Yeah. It took a lot of trial and error. And he took all sorts of wheat doughs and other grain doughs, and it all made a gummy mess. He tried to flake it off and knife it off and things. And one day, well, depending on who tells the story, he claims he uh, was called off to surgery. Uh, his brother, Will, who did all the dirty work, claims he just got tired and went home for the night. <laughs> and the dough uh, became moldy. It tempered is what it's called. And a certain amount of water leaves the, the grain, and it will then, and once you bake it, flake. And that was the Eureka-like moment. And then they toasted it, and then they served it, and it became cornflakes. They eventually put it in a box. They put it in a box. A lot of boxes. A lot of yeah. boxes. <laughs> um, but he did invent quite a few health foods, didn't he? Other he did. Foods. He, you know, he loved nuts, uh, and some people called him a nut. Um, 
But he uh, made all sorts of nut-based foods, uh, uh, nut patties that were meat substitutes, and of course he invented peanut butter. He invented peanut he butter? He invented peanut butter. Not jelly, but he invented peanut oh, butter. He only got it half right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was not the creator, but certainly one of the great developers of soy milk. Long before mm. Starbucks, uh, he was serving soy milk at his table. Uh, we have a recording uh, Dr. Kellogg made in 1923. This is, you have to listen carefully because it's an old recording. He made a series of 78s, uh, 78 records. On the very first, this is actually, one of these is the very first workout tape. Listen to him giving instructions to his uh, people who are in his, I guess in the room, he's teaching how to do the workout and see if you can channel Jane Fonda in this. So we'll listen to that now. At count one, reach the arm forward. At count two, try to touch the toes. With count three, four, return to position. Breathe out going forward. Breathe in while returning to position. Ready? Begin. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So was this a big hit, that these series of 78s? <laughs> well, I much prefer Jane Fonda, but, uh, <laughs> but it was a big hit, and I have the album. I bought it on eBay. It's about 12, 78 RPMs, right. and uh, it probably was the first, uh, it was an exercise record, but it was the first exercise tape, and he, he loved uh, brass music, and you hear that band music, and in fact, at the sanitarium, he would lead all of the patients in a grand march and breathing exercises every day at 6 p.m. Wow, and, and, and he was also an inventor. He made something called the, the lumbar chair? He did. It was an ergonomic chair, and it had that little lumbar bump, right. and it's called the Kellogg chair. I sat in it. I have some back problems, so I really wish I had one. And he even tried to, he made a portable version that he tried to interest Franklin D. Roosevelt into using in his presidential car. Right. But I also know from reading your writings and his work, he, he had what you might call a healthy obsession with bowel movements, didn't he? Oh my, yes. Um, we'll be very euphemistic here about how we... Well, we are on Science Friday. So we'll, we'll <laughs> We're very clinical best. and we respect yeah. that. He, he was obsessed and his great enemy was constipation. <laughs> See how they all relate to that? See, they, they, they're laughing some, with you. Some things never change. And, uh, <laughs> and you have to imagine the American diet before John Harvey Kellogg came along because everybody ate heavily fried fatty foods. Men drank a lot of alcohol, a lot of coffee drinking, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of boiled over foods. No wonder the entire country had a stomach ache. And frankly, they were all constipated as well. And, Famous people were or Warren Harding was constipated. Uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge was they, the John D. Rockefeller Jr. And they all came to Battle Creek Sanitarium. And he would clean them out, so to speak. Uh, he had a lot of ways of doing this. Uh, enemas were one of the favorites. Uh, it, it gets worse. Uh, um, <laughs> but the big, the big problem he worried about is that if you ate bad foods, particularly meat, it would fester in your gut. Mm. and putrefy and cause auto intoxication. And that was not only constipation, but nervousness and a bad attitude and uh, difficulties with life and probably every problem you could imagine was attached to it. So he, he decided you'd, you'd better get rid of this soul multiple times a day, right? Yeah, you know, he, he observed gorillas. He went to zoos and wrote zookeepers all over the world, right. and it's in his correspondence, and he wanted to know, how many times does a gorilla poop? <laughs> and he figured it was about four to five times a day, and he thought that was the ideal. So he said to, he said to his patients, you should be pooping four or five times a day? Yeah, yeah, and he ate nothing but apples and nuts, and so I assume he pooped four or five times a day. <laughs> and uh, and uh, not all of his patients were so successful, but he thought that was the ideal, yeah. This is a good point to remind our audience that we have a couple of microphones here. Good question. <laughs> Maybe about your own movements or something. Might get some yeah. free nothing. Yeah. Uh, we have a microphone here and over on this side, and if you're up in the balcony, uh, 
I'll wave to you and you can come on down. Just come on down and there, somebody will help you find the microphone. Um, you, you've, you passed over something quickly but very interesting because now that we're talking about this stuff, you talked <laughs> about, you talked about enemas and uh, an unusual kind of enema that he invented. Well, there was a special enema room in the Battle Creek Sanitarium. A room. And he invented a special enema machine that could deliver many quarts of fluid per minute. But he liked to give yogurt enemas. Uh, yogurt. And I assume he liked to receive yogurt enemas as well. Yeah. Any kind of yogurt? I mean, he's... Well, uh, flavor it was... wasn't Dannon or, or anything like that. Uh, uh, I think he made his own in the Battle Creek uh, Sanitarium kitchen. Uh, but it was the... Uh, he had read uh, Nobel laureate Metchnikoff, for example, an immunologist who was very impressed by the the, the men and women in Georgia, in, in Russia, who ate nothing but yogurt, and he was impressed by what lactobacillus did to the gut. We were talking right. about microbiome. Right, before. he was early on there. Yeah, and so he really, he, he was doing all this, not with any of the techniques we were, you were just talking about with your former guest, but just by morphology, and by feeding patients certain types of bacteria, they seemed to do better than those who ate other bacteria. And uh, the lactobacillus of yogurt seemed to really help these people along. Probiotics, sort of. Probiotics. He's yeah. doing probi would he, if he were around today, would he be into fecal transplants, you think? I bet he would. I bet he would. He, he'd certainly be on TV hawking probiotics, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he was a great showman and he loved to sell his stuff. <laughs> uh, did he ever come out with his own line of yogurt with the right Oh, at, well, he... he, and he, he did the, they did the cereal. How about the yogurt? He came out with tons of food products and health... And they were all health food products and they were called Battle Creek Foods or Kellogg's Foods. And he later found that soy milk actually grew better lactobacilli and acidophilus than cow's milk or yogurt and hmm. so he really became fascinated with that product uh, by grinding up soybeans and diluting it with water and he helped save the lives of the the Dion quintuplets the fam most famous children that. in the world in the 30s yeah these were real that. quintuplets no fertility drugs and they were premature and they had all sorts of bowel problems as premature infants often do and there was a famous young doctor named Alan Defoe who treated them and Kellogg had his driver take some soy milk up to Calder, Ontario, fed the babies nothing but soy milk, and they got better. Wow, and he also, he also had a, um, a solarium, right? A, a, a sunroom? He did, it was in the center of the sanitarium, it was called the Palm Garden. He grew uh, bananas and coconuts and other tropical fruits that he loved to serve in the dining room. And also the patients of the sanitarium would come there and you know, get the rays of the sun, which is very common in Battle Creek, Michigan, particularly in, in February. Uh, uh, Just and, like today. Uh, right? And enjoy them, They're very much like today, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so there were a lot of, he got, he got the real moneyed and intelligentsia of the, of the country came there, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he, he attracted you know, thousands and thousands of people, but he was very good. Uh, at attracting famous people because he gave them free room and board. Uh, and Thomas Edison and Henry Ford and John D. Rockefeller Jr., who for some reason loved free room and board. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, they couldn't uh, afford all, it. All these famous people came to the, uh, Eddie Cantor, the comedian, uh, came there as well. Yeah. And so how long did, uh, you say the sanitarium is still going? Well, is no. It, is it his? That is, that no, no, the sanitarium closed in 1943. I see. Uh, and the federal government bought the building. Uh, it is still there. It is a federal government building. It's the Hart, Dole Hart Inoue Federal Center. Uh, but you can go there and see a lot of things that still exist, uh, the dining room. Uh, 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 some facilities are now just bureaucratic office buildings. But if you use your imagination, you can kind of figure out. I, I literally drove right by it today. Yeah, you just uh, stop yourself from here. getting off. I, I, I actually did take the time to stop off just so I'd get in the mood for coming here today. What, what, <laughs> what impressed you most about your research about the Kellogg's? What was, what was the thing that struck you the most? Was it their entrepreneurial spirit? Was it the fact that they were, you know, before their time, where they would be at home today? In the way we think about uh, healthful well, eating? Well, two things. Certainly, it's the invention of wellness, and that's really, uh, one, actually, three things. We'll take that. But the idea that John Harvey and his brother Will were raised in a very re religious background and 
how religion as an authority changed in the 19th century to science in the 20th century. Their work really represents that. And then finally, uh, both the brothers, John Harvey the doctor was brilliant for all the reasons we just discussed, but Will was the one who made that serial company hum. Wow. And that's no easy task. And he was brilliant as the great serial king of the world. Just read it on the box. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the audience. There must be some questions of interest there. Yeah. Hi. You talk a lot about the fact that he was respected amongst the wealthy and famous at his time. What about the scientific community at the time? Were they recognizing anything he was doing as legitimate or interesting? Yes and no. You know, Dr. Kellogg was almost kicked out of the Calhoun County Medical Society because in the 1880s because his theories were so unorthodox. Fortunately, uh, it came down to a vote and it was a tie until John Harvey Kellogg voted, so he did not get kicked out. <laughs> uh, a, lot of, a lot of doctors did, looked askance at what Dr. Kellogg was suggesting, but he was also very good at um, uh, sidling up to some of the greatest scientists of the day, Alexis Carell and Thomas Edison and uh, Walter Buchanan, the gastric physiologist. He was a good friend of Ivan Pavlov's and went to St. Petersburg to see his lab. He was so impressed, he hired Pavlov's chief assistant to run his lab back in Battle Creek. So he, it depended on who you spoke to, but he was very good at uh, getting in with the right people. I'm Ira Plato, this is Science Friday. We're talking this hour about the Kellogg brothers and the history of health foods with my guest, Howard Markell, author of An Anatomy of Addiction. He's writing a forthcoming book on the Kellogg brothers. He's also a professor and director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, Howard, what about mythology? Is there stuff that people say that the Kellogg brothers did that they really didn't do? You know, um, you know, chewing your food 40 times, that sort of no, thing? No, that they did. They did that? That they did. Uh, that was called Fletcherizing. Uh, Fletcherizing? A, a friend of, uh, uh, of Kellogg's named Horace Fletcher said that it, you'll, you'll digest your food better if you chew it 40 or more times. And there's a point to that. The amylase in your salivary gland, glands will blend with the food and break it down a bit. They even had a chewing song, uh, chew, 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 that's the thing to do. And uh, <laughs> I didn't write that. Get the to work on that here. Maybe. John Harvey Kellogg wrote that. <laughs> I actually found the music in the Erica and uh, had to get somebody to play it for me so I could do it right here. And, um, you did it very uh, well. But, but thank you, thank you. But uh, uh, that they actually did. Um, now, he had very, very narrow ver uh, visions of sexuality and uh, was very much against masturbation of all forms and called it self-abuse and had all sorts of surgical and chemical techniques to keep young people from doing that. Uh, that really? We, yeah, yeah. Uh, things that we would not recommend today. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, so if you went to the sanitarium, you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew what was happening. You know, today, a lot of people would say that's a healthy thing to do. Uh, for most of us, it's the only time you hear the words, I love you, and you believe them. So uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I think we've gone on to a different show here. Yeah, I think uh, I did. <laughs> we'll get back to that in a future no, week. I'm sorry. Or, a week or two. That, that's okay. We you like honesty. Yeah. It's, you're talking about them. This yeah, is, this right. Is, yeah. You know, this is yeah. who they were, yeah. Yeah. right? And, uh, but we, hopefully we would not suggest those today, and I, I shudder to think of those who went under that treatment. Uh, and, and so other things, that, did, did he originate saying you, you should be drinking eight glasses of water? I day? don't know if he originated, but he certainly recommended that, and he thought being well hydrated was very important to flush out the toxins, uh, both of daily living and the food you eat, so he did suggest that. Um, and he was really into fresh air and exercise and uh, avoiding tobacco and alcohol, certainly based on his religious beliefs, but look how right he turned out to be there. What was he really wrong about? Oh, so many things. I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> I think, um, for example, the invention of cornflakes and toasting them that golden brown he had a theory that you needed to dextrinize food, that you needed to take the starch of, of grain 
and somehow break it down to a simple sugar, glucose or dextrose, and that the body would digest that much, much more easily. That's probably not so true, but it was the reason why he created cornflakes, other than that lady who broke her tooth. Yeah. The, uh, we have to take a break. When we come back, lots more on John Harvey Kellogg and his health innovations. Stay with us. This is Science Friday from PRI. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. We're talking this hour about the Kellogg brothers and the history of health foods with uh, Howard Mark Kell, author of An Anatomy of Addiction. We have a question in the audience. Huh? Let's go right over there. Uh, yes. So I was, I was wondering, uh, this, this sort of reminded me of, of, the, of the movie Road to Wellville, uh, hearing some of this story. Um, have you seen that? And how well does that, that film capture, capture I, some I of I have this? seen it, and it's based on a wonderful novel. Like Tell us about it. People have well, T.C. Boyle wrote a wonderful novel called The Road to Wellville. The Road to Wellville, by the way, is a little, little footnote, was actually an advertisement that C.W. Post of Post Toasties used. A rival. Had nothing to do with, yeah, with the Kellogg's hated the Post. Uh, <laughs> because C.W. Post basically stole all their recipes. He was a, he was a, a, a patient at the sanitarium and stole all oh, their Was that how that happened? And then made Post, yeah, yeah. I, I hope there's no Post employees in the audience. <laughs> Well, their lawyers might be here. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, The Road to Wellville is a wonderful novel, and Boyle did wonderful research, and he then blends it with a lot of imagination uh, of things that are invented. And uh, that would take a, another hour to explain. But as a historian, I, I think the real story is even better. But uh, there's a lot of things in the, in the, in the Boyle novel and the movie that ring very true. It's mm. a good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Next. Yeah. Based on your research uh, into the book, for your book, would you say that um, Kellogg was using his celebrity and his association with the celebrities to support his research, or was he using his research to associate with the celebrities? A little of both. And he really, both he and his brother understood very early on in the early 20th century the power of celebrity and the power of advertising. Uh, Dr. Kellogg was very good at recruiting patients to his sanitarium and loved to hobnob with famous people. He was also very famous himself. He, in 1943, he was voted one of the most admired men in America. And he wrote you know, dozens of best-selling books, so he was quite famous in his own right. But he very quickly understood the power of uh, a celebrity endorsement. Uh, and worked very hard. If you read his correspondence, and there's boxes and boxes of them in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I live, uh, that uh, he's very carefully courting people and giving them free samples of his foods and inviting him to his sanitarium uh, for visits. If he was that popular and he was on covers of magazines and, uh, and, and, and lauded, why did his theories not catch on more with the general public? The whole thing about probiotics, eating well, don't eat, not eating red meat, which America is a, is a meat and potatoes country. Yeah, yeah. What, ha what happened? It That's just... a really good question. I, I think he was sort of shunted to the side as this, you know, kind of friendly old vegetarian guy, uh, grain guy, as opposed to the rise of the physician and medical science yeah. and the laboratory. And he really was an old school doc. I mean, he was born in 1852 and he lived to, to about 1943, but he was sort of pushed aside and almost laughed at uh, mm. near the end of his life. And we probably should have listened more closely. One of the, uh, one of the techni techniques I mentioned at the beginning, we, we were gonna talk about the wolf story. Ah, the wolf Before story. we go, tell, <laughs> us, tell us the wolf story. <laughs> the wolf story. He's cackling one. about the wolf. Well, John Harvey Kellogg loved animals of all kind, uh, and uh, he caught a wolf uh, on the sanitarium grounds. Uh, this was many years ago, and uh, he fed the wolf nothing but vegetables and grains. And the wolf became very docile and friendly, and his, you know, John Harvey Kellogg had 42 adopted children. He never had any of his own, but he had, and the children loved the wolf. They, they played with the wolf, and they frolicked with the wolf, and, and so John Harvey Kellogg would have an, a weekly lecture for his sanitarium guests. It was a big deal. It was called the Question Box Hour, and guests would ask questions like they are tonight, and he brought this wolf out in a iron-clad cage, 
and started feeding the wolf meat. He had done this a few days before. Now, some say he starved the wolf before uh, the lecture, but as he fed the wolf more and more beefsteak, the wolf became more uh, wolf-like and more scary. And he said, you see, this is what happens when you eat meat. If you, <laughs> you, know, if you eat like an animal, you are an animal. And, and he was really saying, you, know, you are what you eat. And uh, it was a really very powerful uh, 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 way to show that off. Yeah. Now, I think before we go, we might have one time for one question from the audience. Yes, sir. Henry Ford was known to uh, want to serve guests at his house, everything made of soy. Yes. Was Henry Ford an influence on, on Kellogg in this way or the other way around? Well, it depends on where you go. If you go to the Henry Ford Museum or you go to the Ann Arbor... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Kellogg claims he introduced Henry Ford to the soybean. Ford says the opposite. But in fact, Henry Ford uh, used, sent his chef to the Battle Creek Sanitarium to learn how to cook the Kellogg way. But they both shared that uh, fascination with the soybean. Uh, Henry Ford, not only in terms of eating it, but making all sorts of products, uh, knobs and accelerator uh, uh, buttons and so on for his automobiles. So they shared that love of the soybean, yeah. Well, fascinating, Howard. Thank you. Howard Markell is author of the forthcoming book on the Kellogg Brothers. We should look for that soon. Yeah, wait a while. I hope I get it done. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm traveling here all the time. I don't know where I am at the time. So. <laughs> He's also a professor of, uh, director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Ann Arbor. Thanks. Good to see you Thanks again. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. We've seen with the uh, current Ebola epidemic, one of the great concerns of today's interconnected world is that when people travel, when you travel, you bring your stuff with you. And not only the microscopic organs that cause human disease, but also the in invasive species, you know, the stuff that gets stuck on the props of your boat or your rudder, stuff like that, and you take it with you, you go to the next lake. Well, here in the Great Lakes region, at least 186 hitchhiking species have arrived. You've got your zebra and your quagga mussels, your rusty crayfish and bloody red shrimp. And as for the Asian carp, you keeping track of that? Well, yeah, 
It's knocking on the Great Lakes door somewhere down in the Mississippi. My next guest is something of an invasive species detective because he uses DNA to track new arrivals and crunching numbers to see which potential invader could do the most harm. David Lodge is director of the Environmental Change Initiative here at the University of Notre Dame. Welcome, welcome to Science Friday. Thank you, happy to be here. Okay, how bad is it? <laughs> well, if we, if we think about it uh, from a global scale, there, there are lots of advantages to globalization. As, as you mentioned, we can all traverse the globe more rapidly than we could. We have more and bigger planes, more and bigger ships. But there are some side effects of globalization that require better management if we're to fully realize the benefits of globalization. So as we do move around the planet, as you suggested, and bringing things with us, either intentionally or accidentally, we end up with some species that cause us great harm. Well, what did they do? What exactly is the harm that they cause? Well, so in the United States, if we look at the United States as a whole, the best estimates suggest that the harms amount to on the order of $1,500 a household in the United States, a cost that's uh, very similar to that of the Iraq War when it was in full swing. So these are harms that decrease agricultural production. Some weeds uh, are uh, invasive species, species from somewhere else that cause harm. They cause damage to human health, Ebola being the most timely example. They cause other harms to the economy, zebra mussels that you mentioned plug up pipes. So there are all sorts of harms that some subset of these non-native species can do. And as you said, in the, in the Great Lakes, we have at least 186 species, and, and our estimates are that's costing us 100 to 800 million dollars a year just from shipborne invasive mm -hmm. species in the Great Lakes. And so you have some special DNA investigative tools to keep track of where these invasive species are going? And the yes. kind of harm they're doing? Yeah, I think that what we uh, and, and many collaborators and I and, and other research groups have done is advance the science in recent years so that it would be possible if the current science and te technology were used fully to really save ourselves from any of these harms. So we need to think in terms of preventing species from arriving in the first place. But when that fails, as too often is the case, we often are stuck with wondering, where is that Asian carp? Where, where are those species? Yeah. How, how can we manage if we don't know where they are? So in order to manage uh, well, you need to be able to measure where they are. So we're using DNA to do that. How do you do, how do, you do that with DNA? I, I, does it, is there a trail of DNA? Breadcrumbs that you follow? Or it's hard to do that in the water, I know, but what happens? It, you must it's have a, your own it's a good analogy. What yeah. we're doing is, is sort of the uh, the, the equivalent for environmental protection, what forensic scientists do every day at crime scenes. Indeed, we and every organism leaves a, a cloud of DNA behind us, if we will, if you will. And in, in the aquatic environment, where it's very difficult to directly observe organisms, that turns out to be a very sensitive tool to detecting the presence of an organism. So we just take a water sample and extract the DNA and look for that that fragment of DNA that is the sort of fingerprint of the species we're looking for. Hmm. Uh, do you have to separate it out from all the other DNA that's in the water? At yes. The same time? So we, uh, in the in the first version of this, which we we pioneered here uh, with many collaborators at Notre Dame, we we did the first. A full-scale field trial with Asian carp is our target, and we extract all the DNA from a water sample. In this case, it was in the Chicago Canal, uh, and then just look for the DNA that belongs to the species we're we're concerned about. So, let's say you take a teaspoon of water. How many different species of species of different types of DNA are in that one teaspoon? Well, we, we've now moved on to sequencing all of the DNA uh, so that we don't just need to look for one species, but now we mm -hmm. can answer your question, and the answer is hundreds or thousands if you're looking for, for all, if you include all the microbes. We, though, so far, as a practical matter in the invasive species management realm, are still focusing on the few targeted species that agencies uh, and the public are most concerned about. How do you know if a species is, is not here yet, but you know, let's say the carp or something else that is yet to be discovered, how do you know that when it gets here, it's going to be trouble? 
Well, so this gets to the, the, the most uh, cost-effective way we can respond to this as a society is preventing things from getting here in the first place. And we and others have pioneered a, uh, an approach uh, that you might call species profiling. The approach is to provide an index of invasiveness or the likelihood with which a species is going to cause harm. And we do that by looking at the characteristics of species. And if we use history as our guide, what we've discovered is that the species that turn out to be harmful, that turn out to be invasive, actually have different sets of characteristics mm -hmm. than those that will be benign. So we can use those now, and agencies are, are increasingly using those, including some national governments elsewhere in the world, to screen species that are proposed for importation and then gain the benefits of commerce, say in the horticulture trade or the pet trade, by allowing the species that won't cause harm to yeah. come into trade and only preventing or, uh, or otherwise managing species that would be harmful. I'm Ira Flato talking with David Lodge, Director of Environmental Change Initiative here at the University of Notre Dame on Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. How, uh, when the species get here, or invasive species get here, um, do, they, do they gang up against us or do they use one another to help each other out? Or is, is that a problem? Can the, Sometimes that happens. Uh, there's no particular reason to expect that that would uh, always be the outcome. But the Great Lakes uh, do provide some examples of that. And one of the reasons is that many of the invasive species, particularly those that have been brought by ships into the Great Lakes, like zebra mussels and quagga mussels, have come and been, if you will, reunited with species that they evolved with and ecologically interacted with in the regions of, uh, of Eurasia where they originally came from. So quagga mussels and zebra mussels are now consumed by round gobies and, uh, in, the, in the Great Lakes. Round gobies and quagga and zebra mussels coexist in their native range and now they coexist in the Great Lakes. So they're all thriving together uh, and in some cases exacerbating the problems that each would have caused individually. Is there one, great one of the Great Lakes that's in worse shape from the, than the others? It's, it, it's perhaps easier to say which one is in the best shape. Okay, um, we'll take it. Uh, take Lake it that Superior, way. Uh, we can be happy, is relatively untouched. Um, Lake Erie is perhaps at the other extreme, having suffered from a great many invasive species, but also from a, a number of other insults that interact with invasive species. With, for example, the, 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 the terrible occurrence of harmful algal blooms of, of cyanobacteria, toxin-producing cyanobacteria in western Lake Erie that caused the shutdown of Toledo's water system mm. for three days. Is, is that because it's the, one of the smaller lakes, the shallower lake? It's, it's, it is the shallowest of the yeah. five Great Lakes, and it is the warmest, and it is the most productive. So um, there, there are more things in the world that can be happy in Lake Erie than can be happy in Lake Superior. I remember when um, we had a mild winter and I went to school in Buffalo and I keep track of Lake Erie a lot. I know, know a lot of scientists up in the Great Lakes regions. And he said, uh, you know, this is the first winter on record that none of the Great Lakes froze or none of the lakes even in western New York froze. And we don't know what's going to crawl out in the spring. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I hear what you're talking about. Yes, and, and Lake Erie uh, is, 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 to continue that, that, the answer to the question about in, interaction, sort of meltdown of invasive species, this interaction between zebra mussels and quagga mussels and round gobies has also been implicated in increases in botulinum poisoning of waterfowl hmm. in Lakes Ontario and Lake Erie. Let's go. Do we have a question? Uh, yes, we do have a question down here in the audience. Please don't be afraid. Come on down. What happens is no one wants to come down, then everybody wants to come down. We don't have time. Yes, ma'am. I have a question back to the eDNA studies that you've been doing. And I'm curious if we're getting any closer to knowing if DNA is present in the water that you test. Does that mean the species is present right there? Would it be miles away? How long does the eDNA last in the environment? How close are we to getting some of those answers? This was initially quite controversial because we didn't know the answers to many of those questions. But in the last couple of years, we have learned those answers through experiments and observations. And in general, 
we believe that when DNA is detected, it's quite a reliable indicator of the presence of a living organism nearby in the not too distant past. For example, the DNA we've discovered that under the normal conditions in surface waters where we sample them, it, it degrades, it becomes undetectable in a matter of hours to days after the mm. organism, the fish, for example, is removed. So it's a signal that is almost real time. Is there an invasive species that you're actually tracking now to make sure that it doesn't, doesn't get here? Well, the Asian carps that we mentioned earlier are two very closely related species that um, we began tracking in uh, coordination with federal and state agencies uh, in about 2009. We've using eDNA, and we have since um, sort of handed that off to the federal and state agencies, and they continue to track the northward advance of Asian carps through the Chicago Canal from the Mississippi River. How about River. those electric fences? They suppose. Um, the, the electric fences are, are one of the management tools that have been used to try to slow down. You sound like a politician like now. Sorry about that. They, um, they're, they're not, they 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 are not 100 percent <laughs> effective. <laughs> you can look online and see a video of a uh, small fish swimming through the electric current. Ooh, and those means the strongest ones are getting through there. It, it doesn't necessarily work that way, actually. <laughs> the bigger the fish, the more susceptible it is to electrical current. Bigger surface area, more debilitating is the current. So actually, it's expected that the small fish would, would be most able to swim through. What about a Native American species that might be invasive to other countries? Are there any like that that come to mind? Are we, are we exporting some species that are going abroad? You know, I talked about globalization to begin with. This movement of species is very definitely a two-way street. We hear a lot in this country, not only in the Great Lakes region, about Asian species. Well, why is that? Because we have a lot of trade with Asia. The Chinese, on the other hand, are suffering a great deal from North American species because the trade is two-way. So their pine forests are being attacked by beetles from North America. They've got Louisiana crayfish eating their rice. They've got American bullfrogs. They've got all kinds of harmful species from North America. All they need is their Mark Twain, and they've had everything from the South. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, David. It's been fascinating. David Lodge is director of the Environmental Change Initiative here at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Attention, please. May I have your attention, please? My friends, you got trouble. Right here, I say trouble right here, River City. Why, sure, I'm a fisherman, certainly mine, and proud to say it. I consider that the hours I spend with a rod in my hand are golden. I'll help you cultivate a horse sense and a cool head and a keen eye. Never try to take an hour quietly to yourself from a three hook sinker shot. But just as I say, it takes judgment, brains, and maturity to score in a ball flying game. I say that any boob can take and catch a car when it jumps in his boat. And I call that sloth the first big step on the road to the depths of degradation. I say, first, it's a little medicinal wine from a teaspoon, then beer from a bottle. Yeah. And then the next, next thing you know, your son is fishing for money in a big track suit. And listen to somebody out of town, Jasper, here until our horse race camping. Hum. Not a wholesome trot and race, no, but a race where they sit down right on the horse. What? Like to see some stuck-up jockey boy sitting on Dan Patch. No. Like what boil, yeah. I should say. Now, friends, let me tell you what I mean. You got gobies, loose stripes, lampreys, crayfish, pondweed, zebra mussels. Now, Asian carp species that'll mark the difference between a gentleman and a bum with a capital B and that rhymes with C. You better drain your pool. And all week long, your River City youth will be frittering away. I say frittering. Frittering away there at noontime, summertime, chore time, too. Oh, no. Get the carp on the spinner. Never mind getting dandelions pulled at the screen door patched till the beef steak pounded. Oh, my. Never mind pumping any water to your parents and caught with the cistern empty on a Saturday night, and that's trouble. You fast, you got lots and lots of trouble. I'm thinking about the kids in the knickerbocker shirt tell young ones. Peeking in the long boat window after school, you got trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble right here in River trouble, City. Trouble, trouble, trouble with a capital T that rhymes the sea there. Take off your trouble. pool. Now I know all you folks are the right kind of parents, I'm going to be perfectly frank. Would you like to know what kind of conversation goes on while they're loafing around that hall? They'll be trying out Winston, no. trying out Salem, no. trying out Marlboro's like cigarette fiends, and bragging all about how they're going to cover up a telltale breath with Sen Sen one fine night. 
they leave the pole hall, headed for the dance at the armory, Liberton men and scarlet women in ragtime. Shameless music that'll drag your son, your daughter, to the arms of the jungle, angle instincts, masteria. <gasps> Friends, the idle brain is the devil's playground trouble. Oh, trouble right here in the city, right here in the city, with a capital C that rhymes with C, better drain your pool, better drain your pool. Show you got trouble, surely got trouble. Oh boy, we really had some trouble. Oh, we had trouble. We're in terrible, terrible trouble. That fish with the big old bee eyes is devil's tool. Oh yes, we got trouble, trouble, trouble. Yes, we got trouble here. We have big, big trouble. With a capital T that rhymes with C. Pull your drain, your pool. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato here at uh, Notre Dame's DeBartolo Performing Arts Center in South Bend, Indiana. Last year, America's, Americans bought 96,000 plug-in electric cars. You buy anybody buy a plug-in electric car? Yeah? Uh, that's nearly twice as many as was sold the year before. And even so, those 96,000 cars make up only about one half of 1% of all the cars sold in the U.S. in 2013. Will electrics ever be able to edge out their gas-powered competitors? Well, there is precedent for this. This battle of gas versus electric is not new. Right here in South Bend, right here in South Bend, Indiana, Studebaker Motors manufactured many variations of electric cars over a hundred years ago. And one of them, yeah. yeah. One of, them, one of them even got 40 miles a gallon, 40 miles a charge, I should say, that were using electric cars, which is just like the Volt does today. So 100 years, we've gotten to the same 40. Um, <laughs> back then, uh, electrics could have been a contender, but gas won out. What happened? What happened? Well, we have a great storyteller to tell us about that. Andy Beckman is the archivist at the Studebaker National Museum here in South Bend. Uh, Welcome, welcome to Science Friday. Andy. Thanks for having me. All right, let's turn the clock back to the 1800s. <laughs> Talk about what was going on at Studebaker. They were, they were making carriage horses first, right? They were the world's largest manufacturer of wagons and buggies, the world's largest transportation manufacturer uh, that got their start as two men at a blacksmith shop. And they, they grew to build just about anything that could be pulled behind a horse uh, to carry people or goods one place or another. And by the turn of the last century, uh, the company is starting to look at this newfangled, self-propelled automobile type thing. The, the discussions around the boardroom, I, you wish you could be a fly on the wall there, but we can kind of gather that the older generation, which included some of the company founders, and they were a family-held company at this time, uh, were saying, no, the horse and buggy is just fine, we're selling them left and right, you know, there's no need to go into this newfangled, you know, fly-by-night thing called the automobile. Who knows if that's going to stick? Remember the bicycle craze in the ah, 1890s? Yes. Right. Yeah. A lot but of people they did lost get... their shirts. <laughs> yeah. But they, they did get into building electric cars. Yeah, Why not was... gas cars? Why electric cars? Well, it was the younger generation that, that really pushed them into automobiles. Uh, but you still had to contend with those pesky, uh, those pesky guys whose name are on the side of the building, like John M. Studebaker. He did not like gasoline-powered cars. He said gasoline-powered cars are clumsy, dangerous, noisy brutes that stink to high heaven and break down at the worst possible moment. Very prophetic. <laughs> and really, he, uh, who could argue with him? At that time, uh, the gasoline-powered car was, you know, in its, in its infancy. Uh, they were difficult to operate. He was right. They smelled bad. Gasoline, when it burns with no emission equipment of any kind, gives off some rather noxious fumes. Uh, you needed a highly trained chauffeur to operate it. Even starting a gasoline-powered car was occasionally a fatal task. There were people actually killed trying to crank start a car, backfire, knock him in the head, and uh, it was just a terrible tragedy. And that actually mm. that happened on a number of occasions. Electrics, on the other hand, you could hop in, flip a switch, pick your speed, off you went. And so, so what kind of technology did they use? Just the, the batteries of the time and an electric motor? Well, yeah, and that was another appeal of the electrics. The electric motor was around. You could order them up from Westinghouse. The batteries were readily available from a number of suppliers. Studebaker used Excite batteries. They were already building uh, coachwork uh, for their horse-drawn vehicles, so it was just a matter of uh, adapting a chassis to an electric vehicle, and, uh, and there you go. So Thomas Edison wasn't building batteries. 
I think he was lending his name to whoever was building the batteries, but uh, you could get some Edison branded batteries as well at that but, time. But he did, he did buy a car? He bought, car? Uh, now the Studebaker Press uh, clippings say the second Studebaker electric ever built was owned by Thomas Edison. And in fact, the, his son uh, wrote to the company in the 1920s, I guess the press department wanted to verify that, and he said, yes, indeed, he had that thing, he drove the wheels off of it until it, uh, he described, I think, it went to its uh, own demise in the early 1920s. You would have thought that he would want to build his own if he's into electricity and he loved the car so much. You would think. Uh, I, th that's a very good point. And that also wasn't the only electric automobile he ever used. I wonder if he was just kind of seeing, you know, look what they're doing with my, uh, with my invention. I have an idea. Maybe it's because there was a Westinghouse motor in it. That could very well be. You wonder if they taped that over. Like, uh, <laughs> just to know the war between him and Westinghouse. Indeed, went on for a long time. Um, they also they also made electric trucks, right? Just not just the cars. Indeed, they made uh, any number of electric commercial vehicles, anywhere from twenty five hundred to ten thousand pound capacity. Uh, those were not as successful as the automobiles. We're talking about their total production run from nineteen two to nineteen eleven was uh, just under nineteen hundred vehicles. Uh, but if you do the math on the power output of the engines, you had a truck trying to carry 5,000 pounds uh, that put out 4.3 horsepower. 4.3 horsepower. No overnight deliveries that, that day. <laughs> <laughs> but once you got it moving, it, it, was, it could go. Yeah, pray, pray for flat country, that's for certain. <laughs> uh, but again, compared to what they were using, which was the horse-drawn vehicle, I mean, gosh, the electrics were, must have been great. The Gimbel's company out of New York ordered a whole fleet of Studebaker electrics. Uh, you know, you didn't have to feed the electric when it wasn't right. working. Uh, you didn't have the horse exhaust to contend with. You didn't have... Uh, <laughs> the horse exhaust. I've never heard it described that way. But I'm going to use that. <laughs> Just really, it was, it was the next best thing they had. And uh, the gasoline-powered uh, vehicles were just not up to that, that level at that time. You know, but today, if you, if you get a, a Tesla or a Volt or any of the other electric cars, you have to plug it in and charge overnight. I mean, the, the electrical structure of the U.S. was not set up for any sort of moving around very far and charging like that, was it? Well, it's, it's interesting you mention that because with the purchase of every automobile, electric automobile, they did include a 15-foot cord to charge it with. Now, what that cord was supposed to attach to, that was another level of technology. You could actually <laughs> buy a rectifier for your house, this big apparatus that you had to plug in. They, they paid a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of attention to instructing people how to charge your electric automobile. They even mentioned that at power plants, which apparently they would just let you drive up and plug into if you knew what to ask for. Uh, they gave instructions as to what to do with, because you know, they're generating alternating current. Uh, the electric car is running off of direct current. That's not going to work too well. Uh, but said, well, you plug it into this thing and, and make this switch and tell them you want this, and you can charge your electric car there. Uh, it, it was really an entertaining read of research for today. <laughs> did, they, did they charge you extra for the charging unit? They, yes. Oh, of course they did. Uh, <laughs> You also could pay extra for a convertible top, too. But yeah, the charging, the charging machine, it was, uh, they even showed how convenient it was. Even if you didn't have a garage uh, in which to, uh, to put this thing in, they showed a, like a brownstone in an urban area where they showed the charging, thing, uh, the charging station tucked under the stairs out front and running extension cord across the sidewalk where your Studebaker electric would just recharge while you, right. you let it sit there, I'm certain, unattended with no harm falling to it. So how many cars did they make, and how many people bought them, and how many years? 1902 to 1911. Uh, they produced, I think it was 1,811 gasoline, or, uh, electric vehicles of all kinds. They sell every one they made? Uh, probably more made every one they could sell, I have yes. a feeling. But uh, yeah, it was not, it was, you know, those numbers are paltry by comparison. Yeah. But even uh, compared to the early gasoline-powered models that they were offering, which came along two years later, it was encouraging. You can see why they still weren't ready to abandon the electric market. And so what happened that they finally had to go, go gas? Well, a couple of things. The development of the gasoline engine was just uh, going leaps and bounds. And uh, you know, it was becoming much more reliable. Gasoline was becoming more available. You d in the early days, you didn't have the you know, fill-up station with everything pay at the pump. It was you had to find a place. Many outlying areas didn't have gasoline available. Um, but really, it was the development of uh, like the self-starter now you didn't have to get out and crank the car, you could start it yourself. Uh, cars came down in price. When Studebaker first introduced their gasoline power cars, they cost twice as much as the electrics. Uh, by the time they, towards the end of the production one, it was the other way around. The gasoline power cars were half as much as the electrics. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was clear, at least to the Studebaker owner, or the Studebaker 
uh, corporation that the gasoline powered car was the way to go. Where, where did Studebaker have any competitors in making electric cars? They did actually. There was uh, they weren't they weren't the first electric. Uh, there was uh, the Baker Electric Company uh, out of Ohio, and they actually started making electrics in 1899. And actually, there was another company, the Detroit Electric. Uh, they actually made electric uh, automobiles up into the 1930s. So there's wow. little, like one stalwart still hanging on there. Are, are there any of them still around? There are a couple. I've, um, I believe the Henry Ford Museum may have a Detroit. They have a Studebaker in the Ford Museum. And well, they should. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few of those hanging around. The ni nice thing was the electrics, uh, from, a, from a collector's standpoint, it's very easy to operate an electric. It can sit for a lot of, lot of years. You throw in a battery and pump up the tires, and you're probably good to go. Gasoline-powered cars don't age as gracefully technology-wise with the fuels and fluids. But yeah, electrics uh, still. It's so surpri is it surprising to you that, that they were getting 40 miles on a charge and that's still what we're getting? And I was surprised to learn that. And then it, it, we started, we were talking about it uh, with the producers earlier, and we think the electric cars and Studebakers age weighed about you know, six, 700 pounds. You know, a mm -hmm. Chevy Volt, you know, they didn't, have, they didn't have to deal with, you know, airbags and other pesky things. Of course, the Volt has safety glass, so we'll consider that a fair trade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and, and so they finally disappeared from the landscape, uh, it, never yeah. to be seen again. Well, it's like they kept surfacing up every now and again. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Um, American Motors was uh, experimenting with electric uh, electric vehicle in the 70s, or these little the commuter car in the 1970s. Uh, you know, it's amazing when gasoline starts spiking up again. Suddenly, everyone's going, you know, maybe it's time to look at this whole electric thing again. And now, you know, it looks like the the big three has really embraced. Uh, Electricity is a viable alternative, one kind well, or another. What was the last Studebaker, the regular car? Last okay. Studebaker was... I remember when I was a child seeing that, especially the bullet one, the bullet car. Oh, yeah, that was their best seller. Uh, last Studebaker was actually built St. Paddy's Day, 1966, March 17th. And some of them still around? We have the last one down at the Studebaker National Museum. Uh, you can, you can come, come down, down and see it. I'll give you a personal tour. Uh, <laughs> that's great. And, uh, you know, it's surprising to hear, I mean, I didn't know this, that the electric car goes that far back, and that it was people were buying them. Yeah, it was, you know, really, what you can't argue with J.M. Studebaker's line of reasoning. It's like, why, why would you buy something that you need a professional chauffeur and, you know, it's just not a very aesthetically pleasing uh, yeah. piece of equipment when you can have this electric thing, you push a button and you go. Right, you could be hit in the head by a crank, you know. <laughs> why not? Thank you, Andy. And your museum is open. So everybody can come down and, and see that last. Check us out at studebakermuseum.org. Uh, open Monday, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, noon to 5 on Sundays. There you got something to do. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Andy Beckman is the archivist at the Studebaker National Museum here in South Bend. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. When we come back, the clues at a crime scene that might crawl away from you, we'll talk with a forensic entomologist. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Right. 
This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato here at Notre Dame's DePartolo Performing Arts Center in South Bend, Indiana. Ah, yes. <laughs> you know, it seems like TV detectives, TV detectives, get it, can collect evidence from anything left at the crime scene, a scrap of paper, or even a reflection caught in someone's eye. My next guest looks for clues that might elude even the best prime time investigator to help piece together a crime scene she examines the insects, the insects found in the area, and it's not your average bug collection. Ann Perez is a forensic entomologist and an instructor at St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I, I guess people, you know, when they watch the crime shows, they're not looking at the insects a lot there, but they're showing up a little bit more on the Yeah, you see they? them every once in a while on TV. What, what kind of insects are they looking for? What's going on at the crime scene? So primarily, I've got two different boxes up here. You've got two groups, two orders that are there, and they're beetles and flies. But mostly what you're going to see people collecting on TV or what you'd be training people to collect are going to be flies. They are, and usually the maggots, right? So a fly goes through its life cycle from an adult fly to laying eggs or maybe even laying, laying live larvae. And those larvae are what are actually eating um, a corpse, using the corpse as a nutrient source. So that's usually what gets collected. But even so, they go, and once they've gotten enough nutrients from the body, they crawl away from the body and go pupariate. They have this cocoon stage, if you're familiar with, you know, a chrysalis or a cocoon for a butterfly. So they go through this puparial stage and then will go through metamorphosis and come out as an adult fly. So you'll collect them any of those stages, but usually the maggots are what you're going for. The maggots. Um, so many ways to go with that sentence. <laughs> um, but, so, but you can tell by the stage they're in how long the body has been there or the time of death? Yeah, or? so there are flies that are really good at sensing a body very soon after death. So and these are flies that a lot of people are familiar with. They're these iridescent green and blue flies that you'll see hanging around your trash. They're really good at eating any kind of decomposing organic matter. Um, or these flesh flies that look like flies in little pinstripe suits. So within minutes on a good day, and for an insect a good day means, you know, not a lot of rain, not a lot of wind, um, and pretty warm, on a good day they'll be there in minutes. And so that kind of starts the biological clock. So if I can pick a maggot off of a dead body and I can age that maggot, then I can tell you you've been dead for at least as long as that maggot is old. Which in the maggot year is what? <laughs> so it depends on the species of fly, right? So you've got very species-specific developmental rates. And so for these green, iridescent green flies, you can be a maggot in really warm times for mm, a week, a, a week. little bit less than a week. So if it's, it's still there, you've been dead just a week. In really, really warm times. If it's cold, you're there longer. Wow. What about other insects? Do they then come once the maggots yeah. are done with you? Is something... So, <laughs> creepy crawlies are coming? Yeah, so there are lots, there are hundreds of species that can be found in a dead body throughout decomposition, and there can be hundreds of thousands of individuals on a dead body at any one time. Um, and so the first ones that are there are usually the flesh eaters, the soft tissue eaters. And then after that, you have some things that are really good at eating those maggots. Um, there's like a beetle called a maggot tiger, and it's observed in nature to just eat maggots. Um, so things that are, eat those maggots, things that can eat the adult flies, and then a little bit later after all that soft tissue is gone, you've got insects coming in that are better at eating things that are harder to digest like hide and hair and um, cartilage, things like that. What kind of bugs are doing that? Mostly months? beetles. Those are, those are the beetles' jobs um, later on. There's a lot of beetles that eat um, maggots, and there are a lot of beetles called hide beetles, very creative, um, that can come in and eat that harder to eat stuff. When did you decide you want to study maggots? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm dead I know, bodies. It's a really and, good you, know, you don't wake up some morning and say, you know, I'm tired of this job, yeah. <laughs> I want to go study so maggots. I blame my father. You blame your father? I blame my father. That's fault all the time. Okay. <laughs> 
he, um, he was kind of an amateur entomologist. He was a scientist, a hydrologist, and loved to collect insects. So I used to collect insects with him. He was also a hunter. And he would bring home, say, a, uh, the head of whatever he had shot, and he'd stick it in this living fence in between my yard and my next door neighbor's yard. I say living fence like people know what that is. Um, it's just overgrown. Yeah. And so a I thicket. would go, yeah, kind of like that, yes. And I would go and collect the insects that would be coming to clean off the skull that my dad put there. And so he'd have a clean skull, and I'd have a nice collection of insects that eat dead things. Um, <laughs> I didn't know at that moment I wanted to be a forensic entomologist, but I knew I loved insects at that time. So I went, I was studying insects in undergrad, and I'm somebody who loves science for science sake, but I also love applied science. And this was my applied science. Somebody could pay you to study the things you really love, yes. which are dead Isn't bodies and insects. Oh, yeah. Yes. Wow. So you... <laughs> okay, okay. How do you practice this? I mean, how do you know what it, how do you study it, right? You have to yeah, practice your trade. You do, and it's very hard to get human bodies for this type of research. <laughs> it's, I can imagine. You that, need you accredited know? facilities, and yeah. as all good scientists know, you want a lot of replication, so it's even harder to get them in large numbers. Um, so instead. You don't create them, do you? <laughs> no, okay. It's just, it's another TV show. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a movie. So we use pigs as surrogates for human decomposition. They have actually been directly compared to humans and haven't been found to significantly differ in their rate of decomposition, we're talking within certain weight classes, or the insect fauna that are attracted. And so a 50 pound pig does a pretty good job of being a surrogate for the average size male. Wow. <laughs> It's so another topic with so many paths I could go down that, that I'm not going to. Um, isn't, I had seen years ago, isn't there a, a sense somewhere, maybe in the southeast, where there is a, there's a, a place where they actually put bodies in the ground and study how they decompose and uh, they watch real people? Yeah, the, there are a couple of, um, this isn't the term they like to use, but body farms. Body farms. Um, there's one at Tennessee is the That's famous the one, one. in Tennessee. Yeah. It's the anthropological research facility instead of the body farm. But yes, they put out um, human corpses that have been donated to science and study the decomposition. And every once in a while, they'll let entomologists come and do mm. research. Now, you also get called in, and this is really fascinating, to investigate cases of neglect. Yes. Tell us about that. I'm almost afraid to ask on So there, there are some flies that are some pretty promiscuous eaters, is what I like to call them. And they won't just come to dead tissue on a dead body, but they'll also come to tissue on a living person. It's called myiasis, so the infestation of tissue on a living person by maggots. And unfortunately, not everyone gets the care that they're supposed to um, in the homes that they go to. And sometimes these maggots can be developing underneath um, dentures in people's gums or in bed sores. And so they'll come and they'll bring you a maggot and ask you to age that maggot and you've been neglected for at least how long that maggot is old. Same principle for determining how long somebody's been dead. Somebody will give you the maggot? Yeah. Sometimes they'll call us in to collect, but if we're not there, they'll collect it and they'll send it to us in the mail. And you go and do what? Then. So uh, we'll go, we'll, all we're there to do is age the insect, and then whoever is filing, say, a civil suit can do whatever they want with that information. Wow. So you'll, tell, you'll, you'll say how long that neglect has been going yeah. on. Yeah. So if I find a maggot in somebody's mouth that is at least three days old, it's been at least three days since it's been, their dentures have been cleaned. Is this a common thing? You get called in it a lot is, for this? It is more common. A couple of cases a year. Wow. Um, can the insects tell you anything about toxicity? You know, so if there are drugs or poisons in the body. The, people work on that. People do. So if you have drugs in your system, then those same drugs get into the system of the insect. So basically by taking out um, 
the food that they've been eating that is you from their crop or their stomach, you can do talks on the stomach contents of a maggot. Oh. I didn't want to say, speaking of magnets, let's go to the audience, but <laughs> it was there, so I'm sorry. It's nothing personal. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to know uh, how accurate, uh, as far as the time, time scale error, are you at being able to do that? And, and the second question, what's the oldest, what's the longest dead body you found? The long, like how, oh goodness, okay. So the first part of the question is, your job as a forensic entomologist is easier during um, times that are less removed from death. So the, if you've been dead not as long, our job is easier. The farther away you go from death, the harder it gets. And usually the wider your range gets, the farther away. Um, now the oldest dead body that I've come across has been a couple of years, confirmed. Has been a couple of years, two years. Can you still learn something from a body that old that's been around that long? Yes, you can. So it's, it becomes difficult because I can tell you that you've been dead for at least an amount of time, and then you could have been dead much longer given other assumptions coming in. And so you can have evidence of multiple um, colonizations of the body, um, and that's how you'd get to an extended period of postmortem interval. Now also with succession, there are insects that come in and persist much later, so you'd be Such looking as. at... You would know. You, you, you have lots of beetles that can persist for a long time on bodies. Mm -hmm. Can you tell if a body's been moved from one so place? That's a good question, yes. So you've got certain distributions for insects. You've got insects that are southern distribution insects, northern distribution insects. So if you found a body in the north and it had southern insects on it, then you can have some evidence that that body has been moved and you're not at the primary crime scene. You had a case that involved a body found in a suitcase in a garage. It was my first that I worked on. Wow, so yeah. there's a lot of wows in that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were a lot tell, of Tell us how you reacted. What, so, tell, clue us in on that one. So. The script this, writers are here gonna take this yeah. down. <laughs> there are um, maybe a couple reasons why you'd keep a dead body in a garage, and in this case, it <laughs> happened. <laughs> <laughs> At least a couple. It happened to be. Yeah. It happened to be that somebody's um, that they were taking care of had passed away, and they were um, collecting social security checks from them. Anyway, so you can be brought in to say, how long has this person been dead? So how long has somebody been committing fraud? Basically, Does the government want a refund. I guess they... I. <laughs> but yeah. you come across this as your first case, and it's one of those cases that you come across and you realize how complicated things can get mm. because you have a body that's been put inside a suitcase that suitcase is a barrier to insect colonization and then you're in a garage which is another barrier to insect colonization and you've got kind of crazy temperatures in a garage you've got to figure out because all of this development of insects is temperature dependent, you've got to figure out and model what the temperature is like in that garage compared to ambient temperatures that you might have better access to. Mm -hmm. I'm Ira Plato. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with, in case you joined us, Anna Perez is a forensic entomologist and instructor at St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. Now, you talked about this, your first case with the body in the suitcase. You've had many cases since then, I'm sure. Um, I mean, how do you approach the emotional aspect of seeing all of this decomposition and dead it, bodies everywhere? Does it affect you personally? It, it does. It, you, I mean, you can't help but be affected by it a little personally, but you try and stay as unbiased as you can when you come across something. And it's all you get this mix of emotions, because say the first time that you go to an autopsy to collect, you have this mix of emotions of, I'm really excited to get to put into play everything that I've been studying, but then you also feel weird about being excited because it's a morbid situation. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing when I talk to people here. You're, it's odd because you're really excited to tell people about it, but you have to be appropriately delicate of those situations. Um, Not our audience, our audience. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't care for the delicate part. <laughs> they, they want the facts, ma'am, just the facts, <laughs> just the facts, you know? Okay. 
Uh, go ahead. Now. But and, and it's one of those things also that you've done all of this research, and maybe like me, done a lot of research on pigs. You've collected off of lots and lots of pigs, and you know the usual colonization pattern of a blowfly laying eggs on you. They like to go for places that stay moist, where you have a mucous membrane. So say your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And then you finally go to your first autopsy, and you're for some reason surprised that that's where you're collecting from. It's this very personal thing when you go. Um, so there's still wows when you first, uh, like on your first case or your first autopsy that surprise you, even though you've been studying it for a while. Yeah. Let's go to go to the audience. Uh, yes, over here on the left. Okay. So do you know about bees? Like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> different. <laughs> um, not as much as, say, blowflies, but I'll try. But do you know, like, I'm in seventh grade, so at gym class, like, we're outside, and a bee is, like, flying around someone, and they start, like, screaming and running away. <laughs> yes. Is that, like, um, will a bee really just sting you? <laughs> See, it's I another wow well moment yeah. that, no, it's in your fine. career that... You do, you get this, people find out you're an entomologist and now people, you know, send you pictures every day of what is this and should I be afraid? Um, so the short answer to that I would say is yes. Um, they will sting you. Yeah, they will sting you. You should take the appropriate amount of precaution around stinging insects, but yes, they will. Especially if you're flailing. <laughs> Well, you're, you're dealing with bugs and, and beetles and things like that. They're crawling away from the scene, right? Yeah. You have to go out and get them if they've left the scene? Yes. You have to kind of see these clues of where they've gone. Um, and you have to try and train. Another part, another thing that I try and do with um, my colleague, Neil Haskell, he's also at St. Joseph's College of Rensselaer. We try and train cops, a lot of training of or crime scene investigators on what to look for, what to collect, and especially where to look for things that have crawled away, things mm. that may have been there and then have crawled away. And um, those are, as soon as that maggot gets enough nutrients and crawls away, it's called a wandering larvae, and it's going away to find a nice safe place to pupariate. So it's gonna kinda crawl around. If it comes across some trash, it comes across the edge of a room, it tries to tuck under carpet. And so you've gotta train people to look for those things. And unfortunately, I've had a couple of times from police officers say, I didn't collect anything because there's a bunch of trash and what looked like rat feces. And then you say, oh man, well, if you, next time, if you can go back, those rat species are most likely puparia that have kind of come across trash and stopped. So one thing that we try and do is do a lot of education for people who are going to be out there in the trenches actually doing the collecting. Hmm. Speaking of education, um, uh, Gil Grissom, the main character from CSI Las Vegas, you're shaking your head already, yeah. is a forensic entomologist. Does he get it right? Do they get it right on the TV shows? No. How bad is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty bad. And I understand why they have to do what they do. What do um, they get wrong the most? What's, what's the So usually most maggots they're... are not like sexy enough, I guess. Like they're not, they're just these kind of white blobs that are maybe hard to see. So they end up using like mealworm larvae or something like that to place on the body because they're bigger, easier to see, grosser. So they use the wrong insects a lot of the time. Uh, do you give them lessons? Do they ask you? Or do they get so, trained? Or? I have not been asked. The, the, Neil Haskell that I work with has been asked. He's been called a couple of times from the producers of CSI to ask a couple of questions on whether it seems plausible, but he, they've never run like a series of whatever they've done by him and ask if it's wrong or right. Hmm. Let me see if I can get one quick question in from the audience before we have to go. Has there ever been a time when uh, there was a lack of insects that made your job harder? So lack of insects. So a forensic entomologist, um, it's much easier to say something about a case when there are insects there. Um, but a lack of insects can also mean, say, a body wasn't exposed for very long. So you have, say, a body in a suitcase like we were talking about. If there are no insects on that body, when you go to it, you can say it was 
quite a short period of time between death and when that body was placed in. A Watch out for somebody with a shotgun around yes. the corner. Yeah. yeah. So that, that there, quickly, there because are, it's a matter of hours, right? That, yeah, a matter yeah. of hours. It can be minutes, but and especially towards overposition. If the conditions were right, you'd expect overposition in a couple of hours. Wow, fascinating, Dr. Perez. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, Dr. Per Ann Perez is a forensic entomologist and an instructor at St. Joseph's College in Rensselaer, Indiana. She's going to be in the lobby after the show. We've got these two cases of beetles here and insects in there. If you have any more questions, you want to see these insects close up, go out there to the lobby. When we come back, learn why you don't want to find titanium white paint in your Rembrandt. It's the science of art fraud investigation. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Science Friday from PRI. A boarding house proper where you get your meals hot. You get fine bread and water and you won't pay a cent. Your taxes are paid for your board and your rent. So turn out every man of you all in a line. From the cell to the stone yard, you all must keep time. You work like a Turk till the bell it strikes one. In that grand institution just over the door. That palace so neat. Fill it old masters painting and sell it on the street. You'll have a fine carriage to drive you to drive you to that grand institution just over the dawn. So turn out every man of you all in a line. From the cell to the stone yard, you all must keep time. You work like a Turk till the bell it strikes one. In the grand institution, just to shout on, our borders are honest, not one of them steal. Pulling out all our knives and points after each man. The windows are airy and part of the sides, to keep our good borders from falling outside. So turn out, so turn out, so turn in a line. From the cell to the cell to the stone, just keep time. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. It used to be, if you wanted to discover something about a painting, where it came from, how old it was, if it really was a Vermeer, you'd examine the surface. Art historians would evaluate a painter's style, analyze individual brushstrokes, and if you wanted to get a really fancy opinion, get really fancy about this, they could put it through an x-ray. But in this age of $100 million art auctions, collector's money, and museums' reputations on the line, well, that all means that museums and collectors are looking more and more to scientific techniques to unravel an artwork's mysteries. My guests have experimented with what science can tell us about an artwork's history and authenticity. Dr. Greg Smith is a chemist by training. He's also the senior conservation scientist at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Welcome to Science Friday, Greg. Thank you, Ira. You're welcome. Dr. Philippe Collant is an associate professor of physics at Notre Dame. He's been experimenting with what a nuclear accelerator can tell us about work at, uh, of works of art. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you so much. Great to be here. You're welcome. <laughs> Greg, what, what does a chemist do at, at an art museum? Well, uh, me and my staff, we really serve kind of three roles in the museum. We do um, analysis for our conservation staff so that when they're going to treat an artwork, they have some idea of what the materials are. That way they can choose what to do, the materials and the methods. Uh, the second hat we wear is we, we do what's called technical art history, so we work with our curators and art historians. Very similar sorts of analyses, but now we're trying to interpret the collection. So we're going to try to answer questions like, when was this made? Has it changed appearance? Is it even a real work of art? And then the third role that we serve in the museum is the research scientist that you would find in an academic institution or an industry. It's just we're focused on artist materials 
and we try to determine how they degrade, how better to preserve our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Now, Philip Urey, you're a, he's a chemist, you're a physicist. What can physics bring to, to our... Well, what physics allows you to do is really look under the sort of surface. And there, there are many different techniques. The sort of two techniques that we use here are sort of based on accelerators. And they come from the fact that we're physicists here. Um, we actually do most of the time is nuclear astrophysics. We study stars. But the fantastic thing is we can use those same um, pieces of equipment to actually study art. And it's a fantastic way of actually getting students engaged in uh, in something else and getting them interested in physics because when you traditionally tell somebody that you're a physicist the first reaction is oh i didn't like that in school at all <laughs> whereas if, if you start through something else you get them really interested and so that's how we got got interested in this and the idea is that you use accelerated beams to sort of probe um, specific elements specific uh, pigments and you can get some information that is not obtainable by just looking at, at so you take the whole work. painting and you stick it in an, an accelerator so we can actually, accelerate? yes so we can actually take a whole picture and what we actually do is we don't stick it in the accelerator we, we bring the beam out we bring it out to air actually and the beam will travel a few centimeters and so we can actually put the picture right at the end of the beam line, bring the proton beam out, and then as the protons will sort of plow through the material, the material will then make x-rays that are typical to the uh, con constituents, that are uh, the atoms that are the constituents of the various pigments. So you can and tell what the paint is made out of? Yes, so we can, we can recognize specific, um, specific elements that a specific paint is, is made of, because white is white is white, but actual the constituents and the trace elements that are in there, those are the ones that really give you the information. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Um, Greg, you helped the Cincinnati Museum of Art solve a big mystery about uh, their Van Gogh painting. Tell us about that painting and, and what the mystery was. Sure. So uh, this was a, a project that was more in line of that technical art history, trying to understand what the Van Gogh painting, um, shown right up here, undergrowth with two figures, what it might have looked like. So we're looking at a, a painting here. It's a very colorful uh, oil painting on canvas, highly textured. And it's undergrowth with two figures. So it's got a couple walking arm in arm under a canopy of trees, and Van Gogh described this himself in a letter to his brother. He said they were violet trunks of poplars crisscrossing the landscape perpendicular like columns, and underneath a meadow of flowers, orange, yellow, white, and pink. And you don't so see any pink there, right? That's the problem. <laughs> that was the mystery. What was this pink that Van Gogh was talking about? So the, the painting was being restored at the time. The, the painting's conservator, Per Nudis, asked us if we could investigate this. He had found actually some little tiny traces of pink on the painting, the part that was covered by the rabbit of the frame and therefore was protected by light. So the painting made a two hour journey from Cincinnati to Indianapolis and we undertook a study of it. Tell us about that. How did you figure out what the painting used to look like? Well, because we had some small samples of the, uh, the pink, we knew that it had faded to white on the surface. That's why it looks white across there. Uh, those small bits of paint, we could use a technique called uh, laser Raman spectroscopy. This is a molecular spectroscopy and direct that laser beam at the, uh, the small bit of pink remnants. And we identified the pigment. It was a uh, geranium lake, which would have been sort of a super modern material in Van Gogh's time. He's painting in 1890, uh, June 1890. This is actually just five weeks before he dies of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. So this is one of his last works. And that geranium lake, it uses a dye called eosin. And uh, unfortunately, eosin is incredibly fugitive, and so it fades very rapidly. So that answered the question, what was the pink? The, the other part of the question was, where was the pink? We know that it was flowers. There are 387 white flowers here. Some of them are white because Van Gogh painted them white, and some of them are white because they were pink and faded. So that's the real tough question is, which ones used to be pink? And how do you, how do you decipher that? Well, fortunately, eosine, uh, chemically, we would describe it as a brominated fluorescein, and that means it has bromine atoms in its structure. And almost no other artist material, and certainly in Van Gogh's time, no material contains bromine that artists were using. So we needed an elemental technique, kind of like what was being described just a moment ago. We don't have an accelerator at the uh, museum. So, Shucks. I know, we're working on it. Uh, so instead, we used a conventional technique called X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. So we're gonna, instead of shooting a proton beam, we're just going to irradiate the surface of the painting with a beam of x-rays, and then the elements are going to emit or fluoresce their own x-rays. And so we're looking for that bromine signature, and that would be as good as detecting eosin 
uh, below the faded surface. So, so you flood the whole painting? Not the, the whole painting. Paint. We actually have a microfocus instrument so we can go on a 70 micron spot, so a little smaller than the width of your hair. Uh, we can analyze selectively the surface of the painting, and it's non-destructive, so we can, huh. we can do this as much as we want. All so you had to hit all those, how many flowers? 387. 387 <laughs> individual flowers. 60 seconds uh, on each flower. If you uh, do the math, that's seven hours of straight analysis, but of course we couldn't do that because it takes three times longer just to move the instrument and focus it. So uh, I didn't mention this was going on exhibition, so we had four days to undertake the work. Uh, so we were moving pretty quickly, uh, but in the end we did the analysis and found out that a little over a third of the flowers used to be pink. And so now you're looking at a virtual restoration. So we've used Photoshop to take a pink color and apply it back to all of those white flowers, getting you just a step closer to what Van Gogh would have seen when he put down his uh -huh. paintbrush. Now, no one's going to go back to that original and paint, repaint the pink. Answer. I don't know any conservator at this point that is going to go in and try to uh, in-paint that. I mean, you have to imagine Van Gogh standing at his easel. He's, he's very frenetically painting, mixing all the paints on his palette. Each one of those is sort of an individual thought, an individual movement, and there's a lot of nuance that we can't really engineer into our virtual restoration. I would imagine there must be hundreds or thousands of other paintings that have lost their colors that would be amenable to something like this. Definitely. This is a notorious case of this, uh, this dye, eosin, but even the natural red dyes that were used, and there are a lot of exciting ones that come from bugs, for instance, so cochineal. Stay away from her uh, bugs. <laughs> Gives you the red dye carmen, it also fades. Brazil wood, which of course gave Brazil its name, fades. Um, mm -hmm. The matter root gives us another alizarin dye that's red. So a lot of paintings have changed color. Uh, what's interesting about Van Gogh is he discovers this when he gets to France, last three years of his life, and he begins ordering massive quantities of this pigment. So uh, in his later works, which are generally the ones that we all in our mind's eye think of when we think of Van Gogh, many of them have changed color because of the use of this modern material. Well, Phil Philippe, if he had one of your nuclear accelerators, could he have done this a lot faster, a lot easier? Um, I wouldn't say faster, probably, because it still takes the amount of time to actually move everything. Um, the, it would not necessarily have been easier what, what the, the, the accelerator brings you in, in, in contrast to the XRF technique, which is the, the, the technique that he used, is that you get it a lot cleaner in the background. So you can see many, many, many orders of magnitude, smaller trace elements in there. And in this case, and in the case of the painting, that would not necessarily have shown you a lot. But in, when you're doing analysis, let's say, of rubies or various metals and things like that. You can find trace elements and actually then trace it back to where those elements came from, specifically in, in the Louvre where they actually have an accelerator. Actually they have, the, the Louvre has one in their basement. The Louvre has one in their basement. It is the only, ex uh, uh. <laughs> literally it is the only museum in the world that actually has one. They actually do this type of work and they were actually analyzing the eyes of a Parthian goddess and initially thought it was glass, discovered that it was actually rubies. And by looking at the trace elements, because they were using these proton beams, they could actually assign the, the uh, mine that these rubies were mined in. So that it really is a fascinating technique that can teach you enormous amount of trade routes and, and things like that. Interesting. So the Louvre, the Louvre has one of these. The, the Louvre one. does have one of those, yes. Maybe that's why Mona Lisa has this sly smile on her. She knows <laughs> that's possible, yes. She knows what's in the basement. Um, <laughs> Greg, have you, have you ever recovered a forgery? by doing this? Uh, yeah, we've unmasked forgeries before and we've studied some forgeries in depth to try and learn the techniques that the forgers use. So mm -hmm. um, one of those at the museum came up recently. It was actually part of a, a course that we teach with uh, forensic graduate students on detection of fakes and forgeries and it had to do with another painting in the collection that was purchased back in 1952, uh, supposedly an Alfred Sisley painting. Uh, as it turned out, there was, and there it is. Uh, this is House in a Village, so we're looking at a painting of a white stucco house. Uh, Alfred Sisley, by the way, an Impressionist painter, so working right along with Renoir and th that group. Um, and so this hung since 1952 in the museum as a Sisley when a couple years ago we had a visiting art historian, uh, uh, an expert on Impressionism who had questions about its authenticity. So it came down and then we began a long research project uh, trying to understand if this could in fact be by Sisley. 
so a project like that usually begins by uh, a connoisseur or a curator in our instance, Annette Schlegenhoff is our provenance curator. Provenance is the history of ownership and exhibition of a work. So she's gonna try and track the history back as far as possible, and that turned up some red flags. So uh, it has a fabulous inscription on the back of it. It says, uh, Alf Sisley, 1874, uh, uh, Gallery Nadar, Paris. So that's the site of the first Impressionist exhibition. So it's almost like it had its provenance written directly, well, it did have its provenance written directly on the back of it. But what was interesting, you'll see that there's a little signature down in the left-hand corner that says 16th of May. Well, 16th of May, uh, 1874, was actually the day after that exhibition closed. So <laughs> that, that sort of looked a little odd. And then when we began looking at how we acquired the painting, it turns out it was bought from a dealer in New York City who was implicated in a, a major forgery scandal a decade later where he had sold a number of paintings to Walter Chrysler, uh, including two Sicilies that were fake. So that was all enough to say, let's do a full technical study. Uh, we undertook that in the lab with the graduate students, uh, beginning sort of a crescendo of analysis. We start just looking really carefully at the picture. We then do the radiography, all the imaging techniques, and then eventually we throw our analytical arsenal at it to try and identify every pigment and medium and varnish. And what we're hoping to find, or maybe not hoping to find, what, we, uh, what you would like to find in an authentication case is something, a material that's an anachronism that could not have been used by Sisley back in the late 1800s. And what's interesting about this is that everything we found was perfect for Sisley and of course is available today as well. And the, the contribution that we made actually came from one of our simplest instruments, a hand lens. So if you look at the signature, the Sisley, Unlike the date, the date's painted wet and wet, so we know that the date and the painting are contemporaries, but the signature is painted wet on dry, so the painting had already dried, which is not necessarily a deal breaker. But also oil paints, as they age, they shrink, and they build up stress, and to relieve the stress, they form a little hairline pattern of cracks. And what was interesting about the signature is the paint of the signature goes down into those cracks, and then back out, and then down into the cracks, and back out which suggests that it was applied long after the painting had dried and aged. And that was just uh, a little bit suspicious. So the signature gave it away. The signature gave it away. All that work and everything else, it was the signature. Well, no, it's, it's actually the total package. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the case against the painting is not rock solid. It's a lot of circumstantial right. evidence, but uh, it all adds up. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from PRI, Public Radio International. Talking with uh, Greg Smith, senior conservation scientist at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Philippe Collin is an associate professor of physics at the University of Notre Dame in, in South Bend, in Indiana. Um, Philippe, do you recommend that museums start getting their own? Absolutely. <laughs> Although it might lead to a lot of surprises. The problem is that there are a lot of fakes out there. I mean, they're definitely beautiful works of art, but there are a lot of fakes out there, and a lot of museums might be losing a lot of their value, their intrinsic value, because that is, it is in their artwork. But the forges are getting better and better, and there are a lot of forges out there. They've always been done. I mean, uh, if, if you look at the, the Shroud of Turin, that was probably a could very well have been a forgery in its time. So Shh. using, <laughs> oh, I know, <laughs> here at Notre Dame that is. Uh, um, but it, it, is, it, it, it is a fascinating subject, but it is something where you need better and better and more and more sensitive right. techniques. And so that is, I wouldn't say every museum should get one, but they should at least see if there is an accelerator somewhere nearby. There you go, like, like yours. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I, the, the Van Gogh that you, you recaptured the original colors, would you suggest that they show that alongside the original, what the, you've discovered? The hope is to do something like that. And I should point out that we also have Van Gogh at the IMA. And Van Gogh, again, in a letter to his brother in describing our painting, says that it's the complement to a yellow painting, which would suggest that it was very purply violet in color. And ours doesn't look violet. And it's from that time period. We suspect that ours is faded. So we'll undertake a similar study. And the goal will be to show the virtual restoration right beside the actual artwork, just to give you a, yeah, a hint so. of what it used to be. And now with like. digital photography and whatever, you can make a pretty good copy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. with it, with it. That's what, and so of course, that's what the forgers know also. <laughs> um, 
Yes, question here. So, so uh, this is a pretty good picture right here. Can uh, do you sell the fakes? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> even if it's a forgery, you're interested. Uh, they have a buyer. <laughs> well, I have a hundred. We're, we're not going to sell this anytime soon. Uh, it's going to probably uh, live its life for now in storage, awaiting kind of the, the DNA of the art world, the next technique that would allow us definitively to say that this came from the hand of Alfred Sisley or not. Uh, but there are instances of fakes that uh, I worked on a, a forgery case uh, trying to reverse engineer a forgery and several people knew that they owned forgeries but they didn't want to return them for financial compensation. The story behind the forgery made it all the more interesting to them, so it became even more valuable afterwards. Now, I, I know you don't work just with paintings. Tell us about the Uzbek coat that you... So we just opened an exhibition at the IMA that tries to bring what we do behind the scenes out to the public. So this is an example of a highly embroidered man's ceremonial coat from Uzbekistan that was uh, given to the museum in 2012. And from a curatorial perspective, this coat uh, could have dated. There wasn't a really strong provenance for this. We know it's from Uzbekistan. It was purchased in Turkey. Uh, but from the curatorial perspective, this coat could be anywhere from the 1850s to the early 1900s. And so the curator asked us, is there a way that you can narrow down that date range? Which for us, the question is, is going to be answered in, in the colorants, the dyes that are used in that, mm. uh, that textile. That time period, late 1800s, it was a rich explosion of synthetic organic chemistry. Uh, many chemists were devoting lots of effort to creating new colors. And so there was a good chance we would find synthetic dyes here. So we took small samples. We have to do a, a test, a destructive test. So we need about a millimeter of those colored embroidery threads. But luckily, the, uh, the inseam right under the armpit was torn on the inside. So we could go in and clip the fibers from the inside, do no damage to the coat, extract out that color, and then we use a technique called liquid chromatography to separate it out. All the samples we get are very messy. They're usually a cocktail of compounds. So we begin by separating them out into individual components with the liquid chromatograph. Uh, we can then get their color spectrum. That tells us a little bit about them. Uh, we can then put them through a mass spectrometer, which gives us their molecular weight. And if that's not enough information to get a unique identifier for the dye, we can take a, a beam of helium atoms and smash it into the molecules, blow them apart, fragment them, weigh the molecular weights of all the fragments. And at that point, you get a pretty much unique identifier. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, it's a mixture of both natural and synthetic dyes, and there are a number of synthetic dyes in there. And we just simply look for the patent date or the date of discovery for the dyes. And the one that I want to point out, it's the green, that's acid green 16. It was discovered in 1899, which sets for us what we call a terminus post quem. You can't make this coat before 1899 because the materials didn't exist. So we can safely say yeah. it's a 20th century object. Well, with you doing all the scientific research and you working with the physics part of this, are, are you going to put uh, plain old historians, art historians, out of, out of work by using science? Uh, you, you oh, oh, no. You, science brings a piece of the picture. But very often, we're only looking or analyzing a very small piece. The art historian will give you the whole the provenance of the piece will tell you, has there been some restoration? Sometimes you'll be looking or studying a specific point on a work of art and you might discover that that is, uh, that that is more recent. It's the art historian who can tell you, well, yes, there was a restoration of that piece in, such an, uh, in a specific time. So everybody sort of brings a, a piece of the, the puzzle together and I think it's ultimately when you see the full picture that you can decide if something is a fake or not. The art historian is just as important as the, the chemist and the physicist. Everybody brings a piece to the, of, of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, we've run out of time. This is quite fascinating. I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank Greg you. Smith, Senior Conservation Scientist at the Indianapolis Museum of Art in Indianapolis, Indiana. Philippe Colon is an Associate Professor of Physics at the University of Notre Dame right here in South Bend. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.
I want to thank you. I want to thank you all for coming out and joining us this evening. Um, you can hear these stories on a radio show this Friday, and you can hear them by tuning into WVPE from uh, 2 to 4 p.m. Oh, we have a... So we have a little gift for you, Ira. Um, you're an extraordinary person. Uh, we really appreciate everything you do for science and certainly for the public good of science. And you exhibit extraordinary virtue, which we really value here at the University of Notre Dame. And so we wrote you a little something to take with you, and I'll explain the pictures too. It says, society turns science to solve big problems in the modern world. Science becomes more complex and specialized with new technology and discoveries. You serve both science and society by making the complicated truth clear. We have awakened wonder in, you have awakened wonder in children and adults alike, imparting knowledge with your creativity, wisdom, and passion. We scientists admire your skill and appreciate your dedication that conveys the hope and promise of our ever-expanding inquiry and discovery. Thank you, Ira, for all that you do. <laughs> and we have two pictures here. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean Crawford. And the, uh, the two pictures here, uh, we have the blood moon that came out the other night with Matt Kishore's incredible photograph. And we know Ira is a huge fan of Touchdown Jesus. Really? I, got it. <laughs> I am. Thank you, Dean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I got it. Thank you. How about it? Thank I'm you, not everyone. dropping this one. Oh, this is, this is beautiful. Two of my favorite spots on campus. And this is, you know, the blood moon. This is the blood moon the other night. Yeah. And this is Touchdown Jesus, Jesus, which I saw the first time when I was here about 10 years ago. First time when I came uh, to the campus. I want to thank all of you for coming out and being with us today because I really enjoyed our, our stay here. So I want to thank you for coming. Um, have a safe trip home. And I have a, one final treat for all of you. We're going to let the Notre Dame Glee Club sing you out with a tune that I think you're familiar with. <laughs> Gentlemen. Rally sons of Notre Dame, sing her glory and sound her fair fame. Raise the gold and blue and cheer with voices new. Rara for Notre Dame. We were fight in every game, strong of heart and true to her name. Her name. We will never forget her land. Cheer and the royal to Notre Dame. Cheer, cheer for old Notre Dame. Wake up the echoes cheering her name. Send the body cheer on high. Shake down the thunder from the sky. The thunder won't though the odds be great or small. Old Notre Dame will win over all. While her loyal sons are marching onward to victory. Onward to victory. Thank you. Thank you. It's here for them. Let's hear for this guy. Take a bow. What do we make a bow? Whoa. Thank you. Drive home safely. See you again next time. See you on Friday.